Okay, come, let us all pray. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you that we can be gathered together as a community, um, all be online. And Lord, we just want to ask that even as we dive into your word today, um, Holy Spirit, will you illumine our hearts? Holy Spirit, will you speak to us through your word? And Lord, may we um, take back something today, something that we can um, apply in our lives and, um, and something that we can obey you in the way, um, in the way that we live our lives um, and be a blessing to those around us. We ask all this and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so the book of Titus, the Titus is found in the New Testament, right? And um, it is a very, very short book. Essentially, it's a letter from Paul to one of his disciples. And as we guess it, the, the, the person's name is Titus, right? And you'll realize that if, if we look at commentary series or everything else, Titus, Timothy, um, these letters are usually lumped together and called the pastoral letters, right? And... 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, all these T books, they are all lumped together. They are usually called the pastoral letters. Why pastoral letters? Um, also because there are a lot of instructions with regard to leadership. Now, at first glance, when, when we are reading through um, the books of Timothy and Titus, we'll be looking, we'll be, um, we, some of us might wonder, uh, what, how, how, does, how, how does this uh, apply to me, right? It's all about leaders and I'm not a church leader, I'm not a leader in any sense of the word. Um, so how does this apply to me? And I think um, it is important for us to always remember that the, the word of God is applicable to all of us, right? Um, every portion of the word of God can be applied to, our, to, to us, to every individual, regardless of circumstances, regardless of um, status, regardless of roles, right? And the word of God is living. And so, so, you know, I, as I told the youth also, I say, don't be so quick to push aside this book just because you're not a youth leader, right? Because there's just so much that we can learn from this. And um, uh, just a quick introduction before we even dive into the text. The book of Titus written by Paul, right? And the recipient was Titus. So Titus was located in the island of Crete and is one of the Greek islands. And the purpose of this letter was, was um, because Paul needed to organize the church in Crete. Right? And there was a crisis situation um, of false teachers who had infiltrated the church. Also, uh, it was to offer encouragement to Titus as he endured ongoing opposition from the ungodly, from the legalists within his congregation. And um, it was also um, for Paul to give instructions to Titus to complete the assigned job of est establishing overseers, establishing leaders in his churches. Okay, and in the, in the letter of Titus, Paul also described what sort of people the leaders are to be. He described also what believers um, should be like in their, in, their, in their relationships with one another. He also described what believers should be like in their relationship with non-believers as well. And I think the heart of the letter, if we, if we were to sum up the theme of the letter, right, it is, it is this. Uh, See, I forgot that I had slides. Right? It is this, that proper Christian behavior is based on the fact that the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all okay. people. And therefore, those who believe in Christ oh, to are to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives as they await His return. And in, the, and in this letter, it, we can see very clearly the link between faith and practice, belief and behavior. These cannot be separated. Essentially, right, um, as with many of the other um, portions of scripture, we see that, you know, if, if you say that you are a believer, you say that you have faith, then your life also must show it. If you say that um, you believe in Christ, then your behavior must show it, right? You have words without action is dead. That's what they say, okay? And so introduction is this, that Titus was a Greek follower of Jesus who was for years a trusted co-worker and traveling companion of Paul, right? This is Titus. And he had helped Paul in a number of crisis situations in the past. And in this letter, we discovered that Paul had assigned him the task of staying on in Crete. Now, Paul had already left Crete and Titus was there. And therefore, um, you see the language used that Paul, Paul told Titus to stay on, right? And Crete is a large island off the coast of Greece. 
The purpose of that was to restore a network of house churches. Now, Crete, Cretan culture, right, was notorious in the ancient world. And one of the Greek words for being a liar was kretizo, right? One of the Greek words for being a liar was kretizo, taken from the word Crete, which means to be a Cretan, right? So can you imagine, right, being associated, your, 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 your race, so to speak, right? Can you imagine, like, just being a Chinese, right, equals to being a swindler, right? That kind of thing. So um, one of the Greek words for being a lighter was kretizo, was to be a Cretan. And when people say it, they know that, hey, you are just a liar. Lah. So these people were infamous for treachery and greed. And most of the men on the island, most of the Cretan men, right, had served as mercenary soldiers to the highest bidder. Also, the island cities were known as being unsafe, plagued by violence and sexual corruption. However, the island of Crete had many strategic harbors, much like Singapore, we're in a very strategic location. And the harbors in Crete, they serve cities all over the ancient Mediterranean Sea. So probably, probably from Paul's point of view, Crete would have been the perfect place to start a network of churches, right? Because anyway, there are just so many people going in and out of it. Why not just plant a heck load of churches there? And now details, you know, details are very much unknown to us, but somehow these churches came under the influence of corrupt Cretan leaders. And uh, these Cretan leaders, they called themselves Christians, but they were ruining the churches. So Paul assigned Titus with the task of setting things straight. And this letter provides the instructions. So what we are going to see in chapter one of this letter is that Paul gives a, a brief introduction and then he dives into giving Titus instructions about his task in the church. You'll notice that in this letter, Paul uses a lot of authoritative language and blunt commands. He's very direct. And it really shows that he wasn't messing around and there was a certain sense of urgency in his words. All right, so now my, um, so let's look into the first four um, verses of Titus and I'll read it for you all, all right? So Titus chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, it reads this, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness. Verse 2, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began, and at the proper time manifested in his words through the preaching which, with which I have been entrusted by the command of God, our Savior. Verse 4, he says this to Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God, the Father and Christ Jesus, our Savior. Right, so from the, from the, from the get-go, Paul actually introduces himself, right? And that's how we know that the author is Paul. Right, he says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. And we notice that Paul uses this language of servanthood. He identifies himself as servant of God, slave of God in his letters, right? And what this tells us is this, that Paul knows his identity. He's, he, yes, he's a child of God, but he also knows that he, he's owned by someone else. He's owned by God. And if he's owned by God, then therefore he's saying that I, I'm doing this in obedience to God as well. And, um, and he also says this, and it's very interesting to note that he he's identifies himself as a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ as well. And so in this, in this start, he actually estab establishes his authority also, his spiritual authority as an apostle of Jesus Christ, right? So as much as he is a servant of God, he's in service to God, but because of this service to God, he also knows that he has been sent by God Right? And therefore, he holds a certain spiritual authority as he writes this letter to Titus. At the, end, at the end of the day, he knows that he's responsible for the churches in Titus. Okay? And, and, this, um, and, this and what was he responsible for? He was responsible and he knew he was responsible um, for the truth of the gospel to be preached in Crete. Right? That truth has to prevail in the, in the society, in the culture, uh, where there is just so much um, uh, unbelief and so much corruption. All right? And 
And so two things that Paul was addressing. Paul was addressing, number one, the faith of God's elect. All right, the faith of God's elect. And number two, he was addressing the knowledge of the truth. Right, the faith of God's elect essentially belief, right? It's not just a subjective feeling, but it was, but here he was responsible and he was addressing the belief that rests on the tradition of the people of God. Right? And knowledge of the truth, why was he um, pinpointing knowledge of the truth here? Is because um, there were false teachings that were going, that were spreading in Crete, and false teachings can only be corrected when truth is understood. Right? False teachings can only be corrected when truth is understood. And truth would be understood when sound doctrine and godly living are blended together. Right? Truth would be understood when sound doctrine and godly living are blended together. Right? It's not just one or the other. It has to come hand in hand. Sound doctrine and godly living. Okay? And then we see in verse 3, he says this, that No, sorry. You see, we see this in the, the end of verse 1. He says that the knowledge of the truth which accords with godliness. And, and this tells us also that genuine godliness requires a good foundation of truth. So, you know, sometimes when, and, and I, I, I say this to the youth when I, was, when I was teaching them this, I say that, you know, how do we know what it means to be a good Christian? How, how do we know that we are living a life pleasing to God? Right, you know, sometimes it's just so easy for us to just say that, oh yeah, you know, just love, love, love. Right, um, show love to people. Correct, show love to people is not wrong. But what does this showing love look like? What does this um, living in obedience to God look like? Right, we can only know what is pleasing and what is holy and what is righteous um, when we actually uh, dive into His Word, when we actually look into His Word um, for the proper understanding and the proper um, instructions from him, right? It is, and it is so uh, critical for us to actually um, take the instructions from, from the Bible itself as opposed to leaving it to our own subjective interpretation of what we think God is expecting of us, right? And so genuine godliness requires a good foundation of truth and right living stems from right living Right, we talk about right living. Right living stems from, and it begins from right knowing. We can't live right if we don't know right, essentially that. Okay? And so our faith and knowledge rest on hope. And what, what hope is this? It is the hope of the eternal life that we have through Jesus Christ. And it has been promised from the beginning of time. And you look at the, you look at the um, language that Paul uses here in uh, verse... Two, he says this, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies. And right from the start of the letter, we can see that, that Paul was already contrasting the nature and the character of God, the Father, against the, the God of the, Cre of, of the Cretan people there, right? The, the, the Cretan people, and later we will talk a little bit more about it, but they exalted, um, they, they prided themselves as the place, the birthplace of the chief god Zeus, right? And Zeus was known to be a swindler, and that's why the people were also liars. And 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 Paul, right from the start of his letter, he says this, right? The God that we worship, the God of the God who the Christian God essentially is a God who never lies. Compared, compared to the 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 God, the Cretan God, right? Zeus, who is a big liar. Okay? And um and, and, and one of the problems, and, and so the, the problem, one of the problems in the Cretan churches, right, and we just talked a little bit about Zeus, is that they had assimilated their ideas about Jesus, the Christian God, to the ideas about the Greek gods that they grew up with, right? And I think we need to understand, we, 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 we got to understand that the, the Cretan church was a very young church, right? They were a very young church, and a lot of the Christian, the, the Cretan Christians were actually, um, they were in Pentecost, they, they were with all the others at Pentecost and they came back. So they were a very, very young church. And so because they were like first generation Christians and a lot of things, they, they might not have really fully understood uh, what this new religion were about. And so they were very, still very influenced by the culture around them. And so the Cretan people claimed that Zeus was born on the island. 
and they love telling stories and mythologies about, about his underhanded character. So essentially, right, Zeus, uh, his underhanded character was glorified. And part of the things that he did, right, was that he would seduce women and he would lie to get his way. And Paul wanted to make this very clear that the Christian God revealed through, through Jesus is totally, completely different from Zeus. His basic character traits, Jesus says the Christian God's character traits are faithfulness and truth, not lying. And that means that the Christian way of life will also be about truth also, which will be a real change for Cretans. Essentially, the Cretan way of life is that of lying. But Paul is saying that no, the Christian way of life is that of truth. And it's completely counter-cultural from what was the norm in the society of that day. Okay? And then in the end of verse 4, he says this, he says, To Titus, my true child, in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. Now, um, here he's not saying that... Um, uh, Titus was Titus was not exactly Paul's uh, birth child, right? Paul Paul didn't Paul wasn't married, and Paul didn't uh, give birth to Titus, right? Um, essentially, he it shows when Paul um, called Titus his true child. Um, Paul also called Timothy his true child, and it shows the quality of both Titus's and Timothy's relationship with Paul. And what we can say is that um, Titus was. A recipient of direct spiritual download from Paul, um, Titus was so-called being discipled by Paul, and Paul was in a certain sense uh, his spiritual father. Okay, now we go to the, the, to the second part of the, the first chapter, right, from verses 5, right, and he says this, okay, verse 5, all the way to verse 9, okay? And I'm going to read verse 5 to verse 9. He says this, This is why I left you in Crete. So he tells us that Paul left Titus there. Right? He didn't send Titus there. Both Paul and Titus were there together. So that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. Verse 6, If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers, and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Now, in just these few verses, Paul states out the need for overseers. Now, we go use the word overseers, leaders, elders, a little bit interchangeably, right? But essentially, we can just put them all under the category of leaders. There was a need for leaders in the church, right? And so, um, as I shared earlier already, that um, in the island of Crete, then Judaism was very active during the New Testament times. And some Cretans were the first generation Christians who were at Pentecost, and then they came back to Crete, and, uh, and they were the first Christians in um, Crete. And so this group of, of believers, they were not very well organized, right? And Paul, based on his language, Paul had to leave before he, com he could complete his work in Crete. And there was one thing, one thing that was left and that was to appoint responsible leadership. And it seems so pressing, right? Like, you probably think that, oh, yeah, it's just, it's just um, appointing leadership on you. Uh. You know, um, we, we, that one can wait a little while. Uh. But Paul actually was saying that, no, this is quite pressing, and we need to appoint responsible leaders ASAP. And then after that, he goes into his qualifications. So he tells Titus this, Titus, you need to go and find leaders for the church. And then, probably preempting Titus's um, uh, question to him, Paul states, Paul, um, next thing he tells Titus that, I tell you find leaders, right? Now I'm going to give you the qualifications of the leaders. And that's why in verse 6 to 9, we see a whole list of qualifications for leaders. And, and I do believe that those of us down here who have gone through leadership training in church, 
a lot of these qualifications have been used um, as part of the leadership training curriculum, right? To tell us exactly what Christian leaders should be like, and um, rightfully so. And as we go as we go down the list, uh, we will understand why this is so important for Christian leaders. And he say, he says this that a leader has to be a both reproach, right? He has to be blameless, cannot be accused, have an untarnished reputation, and his life essentially his life should be worthy of imitation. So, for example, I'm very, I, I, I do believe that we are very blessed that, and, and, and as, we go down, as we go down the line, I'm sure I do believe that you will be able to see quite a few of these qualities in our own church leaders. Right? And as I was doing a study of Titus, I say I am blessed to have leaders above me. I am blessed to have pastors who actually embody these qualities right, um, of Christian leaders. Right? Life should be worthy of imitation. Next up, Husband of one wife. I think that goes, I think that one doesn't need to be explained. Huh? Um, the, the person has to be faithful to his or her spouse, his spouse specifically. And um, now he says this, that your children are believers. Okay, this might be a little bit contentious and let's uh, spend a little bit more time in, in, uh, on, this, on this portion. When I think, when, when, when Paul was saying that the children are believers, um, some of us, some people might take it to mean that, oh, the children also must be Christian. And that will uh, pose a little bit of a problem because uh, we can't be, I mean, we all know that we cannot control the faith of anyone, right? We can't control anybody, uh, anybody's um, uh, state of belief or choice of what he or she wants to believe in, right? So what is the way to understand this 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 statement down here where he says that uh, his children are believers. I think what we can understand by this is that that um, the word believers, the, Greek, the, the word that is used for believers down here can, would translate to mean um, faithful, trustworthy, reliable, and respectful. Right? So what we can say is that um, the leader should have children who are faithful, who are trustworthy people, who are reliable people, and who are res respectful people also. And it, it, is, it ties in with the second part of the verse where um, the, the conflicting behavior and character traits of reliability, of faithfulness, and trustworthy is mentioned. It says not open to debauchery or insubordination. Okay? And so... Why, I expect, why is this expectation being placed on the parent, right? I think what we can understand, what we can probably glean from this is that um, good and wise parents can influence their children's actions and encourage them to be a trustworthy people, uh, but they definitely cannot con control their spiritual response to God. And I think to a large extent, um, parents wouldn't disagree with this, that, um, that they um, are responsible uh, for their children's upbringing. Right now, these children down here, specifically children, uh, they are not um, very specifically. They refer to uh, young young kids uh, who are still under the parents' authority. Okay. Okay, and so um, verse seven starts this. It says this for an overseer as God's steward, and uh, it tells us in verse seven uh, the need. For such qualifications. And very specifically, it says that an overseer, a leader, is God's steward. Right? It is his, he represents God to serve the people, the, to serve the, the, the sheep of God's flock. Right? And a steward, a steward is entrusted with God's work. In the same way, also, um, our local church executive committee in, uh, in our church, the LCC leaders, they are all stewards and they are all given responsibility. They are all been entrusted with God's work. All right, and verse 7 after that lists a whole list of behaviors that um, a leader should not be. Right, we go, go through this list quickly. It just says, do not be arrogant, do not be stubborn, do not be inclined to anger, um, do not be inclined to drunkenness to violence, or to be greedy for money. Now, um, I think most of it are self-explanatory, and I uh, just want to spend a little bit more time on this whole greedy for money thing. Right? Um, some of us might, um, I think greedy for money, it, it talks about, you know, uh, don't let money be your, your, your lord and master. And I think 
um, if we just take the literal sense of the word, we can talk about um, it being that um, yeah, a leader shouldn't be be involved or or you know don't 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 tempt yourself with money so that you don't embezzle embezzle funds you know and things like that. Uh, but I think if we take the principle of the greed for money and and everything else, I think um, I think it does include also a little bit by a little bit of you know the 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 whole thing about you know being bought over by favors and uh, it is it is it is it is something which it, which we all can be very um which we all can can be actually tempted by right when someone treats us well when someone showers us um with gifts uh with treats and things like that um we it could sway us in the way that we make our decisions and we could we could make certain decisions that tend to favor these people who heap such um uh such things upon us such blessings upon us and i think this is something which um which we really need to be careful about because it's not just money per se but it's things uh material things which um in a sense have got monetary value right um and i've seen and i've heard stories which is very very sad of leaders actually um being leaders meeting the downfall so to speak uh, when they had allowed uh, such things to um, to sway them, when they have um, when they have like you know given up their conscience uh, for the sake of um, you know all these treats and all these blessings and all these favors that are being showered upon them, and so I think this also reminds us as a good reminder that you no know, money is not evil, but the love of money is the root of all evil, right? And then verse 8, all right, um, and, and so we're just going through the list right now. Verse 8 tells us that leaders should be. So it tells us first, verse 7, leaders should not be. And then it tells us that leaders should be this. And verse 8 tells us that leaders should be hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. And verse 9, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Okay, and um, list of desirable qualities of leaders are such. And the, the, the nice thing is this, that these characteristics are not unique to leaders, right? I repeat, these characteristics listed in the scriptures here that we have just gone through, whether the, don't, the do not do and the do, I, these characteristics are not unique to leaders. For in one way or another, they describe the character of all Christian men and women. They describe the character of all Christian men and women. Even if we move out from the text of Titus, even if we move out from the text of Timothy, uh, the, 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 the letters of Timothy, we will see that we will see that these characteristics are mentioned many times in the Old and the New Testament, and this is expected of all Christians, right? If you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, you've got to exhibit these things, right? Then you must be worried. Then you must question, like, like so why is it put down here specifically, you know, for leaders? And I think what we can, what we can understand from this is that the function here really is to portray a morally well-rounded person. I mean, this whole list down here, it really just tells us that, that we got to be morally well-rounded and that a leader has to be morally well-rounded and not disgrace the Lord and his church, right? A leader must be morally well-rounded and, and should not disgrace the Lord and his church. So literally, if we just take the literal um, understanding of this, of this um, qualifications down here right it, it might seem like oh you know um it's a checklist that i must tick 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 also oh, so if john Choi wants to be a leader in church all right come let's evaluate him um is he hospitable check is he arrogant what wow, he is a what wow, miss strike out you know it's not a checklist for leaders right but i think we understand the principle and the heart the spirit behind the the message and um and what it tells us is that really before we choose leaders for um for the church right or if you want to be a leader then you really need to assess yourself right um are you a 
in general, a morally well-rounded person. Sure, you might have, you, you know, we might be missing the mark here and there. We all do, right? Right, a little bit here and there. I, for me, I'm, I'm quite impatient sometimes and I can be quick-tempered, right? Um, and and this is, these are just areas where, where, where the Lord is working uh, in and through me, you know. Um, but, but, but I think, um, so I think these guidelines um, help us in, in angling and directing our thoughts in the way that we, we approach the choosing of leaders. And I do believe, I do believe that um, our, our pastors and church leaders, when, when, uh, when they are searching, uh, when they are praying to God and asking for, for new leaders, for new CGLs, for new LCC leaders, right, they are looking for um, moral character. Okay? Verse 9 tells us this, that a leader, a leader must hold firm to the trustworthy word, and he must be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Okay. And um, I think this is so important. Um, I realize, and I think many of us down here might also realize that more and more people these days are getting, uh, are not uh, very biblically literate, right? The biblical literacy is on the rise. Um, many people don't read their Bibles anymore. Many people rely on, on um, what they hear from sermons. Um, not saying that sermons are bad, but it is always so important for us to actually go back into the word, right? And this is something which like, for example, um, the Berean Christians were, were commended, right? Because they were not just listening to what people were saying, but they were saying that, you know, I listen, good. Now I'm going back into the word to go and search for it, right? I'm going to study the word and I'm going to make sure that my doctrine is sound. My doctrine on Christ, my doctrine on theological issues, my doctrine on the things that I read in the Bible are sound. And it is so important right now also, you know, in this time and age for us to really hold fast for, to, to, to sound doctrine. Because, right, there are just so many things that are happening around us that could sway us if we do not know our scriptures, we do not know uh, what um, the, the content of our Bibles well, right? Um, and... And I think we can we we look around us and what's happening in 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 the world and even in our own backyard, right? Um, certain understandings about certain issues, right? Everyone's just putting many people are just put uh putting their own interpretation, their own spin on things, um, their own feelings into the way they they address an issue, right? Even Christians for that matter, okay? And it says down here that leaders also have to they have to be able to give instruction in sound doctrine. And they are also to rebuke those who contradict sound doctrine. Okay. All right. So now we're in the home stretch of chapter one. Right. And we are just going to look through verses 10 to 16. And I'll just go read it for us. Verse 10. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. Verse 15, To the pure all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving nothing is pure, but both their minds and their conscience, consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny Him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. Now Paul down here, after he states out all the, you know, the, the qualifications for leaders, you know, say titles, go and choose all the leaders, blah, blah, blah. Um, leaders should be like that. Leaders should not be like that. And then he gives a why. He gives a why. And, and he says this, that the problem in Crete is the problem of false teachers. And these people, these false teachers, their teachings need to be opposed, right? And verse 10 to 16 then introduces the people, the false teachers, the kind of false teachers who are um, in Crete. Okay, and they have to be opposed by leaders who are doctrinally capable. Okay, and verse 10, verse 10 introduces us the kind of 
the, the, the characteristics of these false teachers. They're insubordinate, right? They're insubordinate. And if we, if we look at verse 6 of, if we look further up of verse 6, it says this, that, um, that good leaders, right? Good Christian leaders should not be insubordinate. So on the flip side, the problematic teachers are insubordinate, right? They think that they are right. They are not going to subject themselves to leadership. They are not going to listen to instruction, right? They don't care about authority. Another thing about these false teachers, they are empty talkers and deceivers, right? They react without careful consideration um, of their words and their actions. Okay? And um, it, they also deceive the hearts and the minds of, of those um, whom they speak to. Okay? So they, they not only speak without thinking, they also speak to deceive. And then verse 10, it tells us also they are of the circumcision group, right? What is this circumcision group? Um, again, I said that um, earlier in uh, earlier part just now, I, I introduced that, there are, that Judaism was still very rampant. Um, the primary religion in the, you know, Judaism was still uh, one of the main religions in the island of Crete, right? And, and these were not Christians yet. But a lot of these false teachers, they called themselves Christians. They called themselves Christians, but they were actually not uh, living as Christians. And they are of the circumcision group. They are those who taught that legalistic practices were still needed for salvation, right? In other words, they were ethnic, they were ethnic Jews, right? They were eth ethnically uh, Jewish Cretans who said they followed Jesus. But similar to the problems in Galatia, these people demanded that the non-Jewish Christians, the new Christians, the new converts, be circumcised and follow the laws of the Torah if they wanted to become followers of the Jewish Messiah. Right? Essentially, they're saying this, um, because they're Jewish Christians, so they were already circumcised. Right? But for the new Christians, they say this, hey, 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 you all you must be circumcised first. If you don't, if you're not circumcised, then you're not Christian. But obviously, we know that you're not saved by, by that. Right? And so there was wrong doctrine, right? Wrong doctrine, wrong teaching. And these false teachers, right, they wanted to pull people to their side. So very possibly there was a gossip, slander, um, amongst all these things, that their tongues were wicked, so to speak, right? And, and therefore, the problem with these false teachers was this, and the, the danger with these false teachers was this, that when they were followed or they were listened to, relationships were disrupted these false teachers were turning whole families upside down. They were teaching for their own selfish gain and they were just in the church leadership business to make money. And therefore, Paul was so, there was a certain urgency in Paul's language, right? And Paul, to Paul, there was a need to silence these false teachers. There was a need to silence these false teachers. And maybe we just pause a little bit down here. We just, um, we, we just reflect on this whole thing that Paul was addressing here. Right. And, and I think that when we read this scripture, it is also very important for us to check ourselves, to check our hearts. It is important for us to check who and what we listen to. Right? There are many things that people say. There are, there are, there are, and, and, and many times, um, and it happens in church, sadly. Right? It, you know, um, there will be people amongst us who propagate certain thoughts, or who propagate certain sentiments, especially if they're not happy with something, right? Um, they will say things and they try to get people on their side. And they and people, and these people might be very influential in their own rights. But other things that they are saying or they are propagating, are they tearing the community apart? Sure, you might say that they are not tearing your physical families apart, but if we look at the bigger scheme of things, we are a church family, we are a family of Christ. Right? Are the things which we are hearing, the things which we are believing, the things which are being said, um, especially, are, are they being said for their own gain? Are these things actually breaking the unity of the family of God? Are they straining relationships instead of helping to repair them? And if so, right, then these things must be stopped. And as much as we, we look out for these things and we say that we need to stop these things, um, we pray also. We pray and we need to be so sure. We need to always reflect and check ourselves that we are not one of these people who are spreading disunity 
within the church, within the family of God. Okay? And Paul, and, and, and so now we look at verse 12, right? And Paul, Paul is a very brilliant person. I love reading Paul. I love Paul, right? He, he's, he's so direct um, and he's so smart as well. You know, and, 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 and as much as he's, he's smart, right? He's also very um, led by the spirit, right? And I admire I, Paul. And Paul here, in his brilliance, right? He pulls a quote from an ancient Cretan poet. He pulls a quote from an ancient Cretan poet. He probably says this, guys, you all know this fellow, fellow very well, right? I'm going to quote him. Right, and he says this, and 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 this ancient Cretan poet, he was very frank and honest about his own people. He said that Cretans are always liars, they are vicious beasts, and they are lazy gluttons. Right? They blur the lines between true and false, between good and evil, and they are just in it for the money. Right? And Paul said this, and, and Paul quoted this Cretan poet. And this poet just said this about his own people. You are liars, you are you always find the gray areas to play with, right? You, are, you always blur the lines between what is true and false, right? Maybe not true, not false, also go and say it's true. And, and Paul, and so, you know, um, when Paul says this, one of the Cretans a prophet of their own, right? He's not saying that this guy is a Christian prophet, lah, okay? He's not calling the person a prophet, right? But he appealed to the understanding in their culture that he was, that he was a certain figurehead down there. And therefore, the function of him to quoting this poet is saying that, you know what? This is what your own people say about you. So don't kind of say that I'm biased. Don't kind of say that I, I'm trying to pick on your... Your own people also say this about you. And a well-known figure in your community says this about you. So take it as it is. This is true about you, okay? And, and, the, and on the account of this, Paul, on the account of this true statement, okay? Um, on the account of this true statement, Paul says to rebuke the, the false teachers sharply. To rebuke the false teachers sharply. And what are these false teachers? Why? Because these leaders claim to know God, but their Cretan way of life denies him. They have to be dealt with. Right? These false teachers, they say, I know God, I know God, I know God. But then when you look at their life, right? Their life is so far away from the God that they serve. Right, they serve this God who is so good, who is so just, who is so pure, who is so holy, who is so righteous. And then you look at these false teachers and you look at their life and you're like, wow, this one like rotten apple compared to one fresh, nice, juicy apple. Right? And, and so, um, you know, and Paul actually says this that we need to rebuke these people. And Paul uses very strong language down here. Lah. And as I was reading this, actually, I thought, you know, how often do we shy away from rebuking people who are wrong um, for fear of maybe being disliked? And Paul down there is saying that, hey, you know, if you know that there's something going on wrong, right, you need to do something about it, you know. You can't stand one side and then don't do something. Okay? But then, uh, Paul then says in verse 13 also, he says that you don't rebuke for the sake of rebuking. You don't rebuke to make yourself, yourself feel good. He says this, rebuke them that they may be sound in faith. And hearing we see Paul's heart. We see Paul is not this maniac who is trying to go on a witch hunt to find all the false teachers and crucify them. No! His heart, right, is really the heart of Christ. We built them so that they might turn around, so that they might change the wrong doctrines that they are holding, so that their faith may be sound, so that they stand rightly, in, you know, that they are having the right faith and the right relationship with God, their Father, with the God that they profess to love, to the God that they profess to believe in. Rebuke is needed for them so that hope is offered that they will come to the truth and to be freed from Satan's trap. Hearing, right, you see Paul's heart and it is just so comforting and it's so encouraging, right? And, it, and really, he, Paul sets such an example to us especially for those of us who are in leadership, that, hey, you know what? Sometimes we need to discipline. But, right, discipline, right, is not because, you know, we want to throw our authority, we want to throw our weight around. But discipline, right, because we love the person, we care for the person, we say, hey, you know what? You need to come back onto the right path. Okay? In verse 14, Paul um, addresses the two teachings that the circumcision group uh, 
two, two teachings of the circumcision group that must be refuted. Number one was uh, Jewish myths, right? Um, there, are, there are many, um, you know, the, the history of the Jewish people is just uh, so um, extensive and, and therefore there are actually Jewish myths, right? And uh, some of these Jews uh, spread non-biblical deviant stories. So these are the things that needed to be stopped. Um, and the, the other teaching was that, um, was that some of these false teachers were substituting human commands for those of God. Okay, and um, I think we don't, we don't, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm very thankful that in church we don't really see uh, people who are intentionally substituting human commands for those of God, right? Um, but I think not intentionally, but probably unintentionally with uh, good meaning also, right? Um, maybe we have even taught or people have taught um, some of the things that we need to follow and uh, pushed it down as, as uh, canon, as like, oh, this is, this is true Christian belief, okay? Um, I don't want to open a can of worm down here, but for example, uh, some people say that, um, mm, some people say that if you marry a non-Christian, you are a sinner. Ah, okay, so things like this, right? Um, and, 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 and these things are said with good intention. These things are said with, with good heart to it, right? And, and, but then, right, over time, uh, sometimes, right, it has been, uh, it has, it, it becomes, it makes it seem as though, like, this is the law. This is what God says, okay? I remember uh, when I was young, uh, my mom was, my, we grew, I grew up in a Christian family, uh, my mom uh, had been attending church since she was young and everything else. But then um, she was always, so, okay, so for example, for her right, as a Christian and growing up in a, in a household with uh, lots of non-Christians and idols and everything else, to her, right, the presence of idols itself um, signifies a lot of uh, spiritual darkness. So as, so, for, as a Christian, we need to keep away from idols as much as possible. Uh, we cannot have um, anything to do with like dragons or, or snakes or whatever. Why? Because in Revelation, it says down there, uh, um, the Drakanos. Uh, so dragon is evil. So things like that, right? And, and, and as a young child growing up, obviously I learned from my parents, uh, so I started thinking that, oh, you know, all these things are evil and like if there's evil down here, then we must renounce and things like that. Um, and, and sooner or later, right, it became ingrained to me as though like, oh, this is right Christian living. Um, but I never checked the scriptures about it, right? Now, um, it was only in the later part of my, of my Christian years uh, where I went to Bible school and things like that, you learn a little bit more, you read the scriptures a little bit more, and you realize that a lot of all these things sometimes stem from fear, sometimes stem from cultural um, misinterpretation, or sometimes stem from even certain superstitions that, uh, have, been, that, that have been shaped by, by, um, by the culture that we are in. La, right? And so some of these things um, could be, you know, we could be unintentionally teaching people uh, teaching our younger ones, um, but actually they are not scripture. And therefore, again, I, I go back to saying that it is so important for us to know our scripture. All right. And here we come to the final verse of the chapter, right? And he says this, these false teachers, they profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work, right? They claim to know God, but they and, and this was the climax of Paul's assault on the false teachers. Why we say it's climax? Because really, Paul really hunted them like crazy. Paul basically just unleashed all his weapons and he just says, you know what? I'm, it's time to attack you all, right? He says this, that they claim to know God. They say they know God, but the actions don't fit their words, okay? The actions actually show that they deny him. And um, he said in verse 15, they are like that because their minds and their conscience, these things are corrupted. He calls them detestable, extremely strong word that he uses there. And um, this word 
was also used to describe uh, the hypocrites um, in Luke, right? And and it just really shows us that 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 these things cannot be tolerated. Paul was not even going to tolerate these things at all. He just says, you know, they are de de they are detestable people, they are disobedient people, and they are unfit for any good work, right? He ends off the first, and again, I think we, we read the, the letter of Titus, we don't read it as, um, if by right, you know, when you read a letter, you read the whole letter, but, you know, in our, in our modern Bibles, we have separated it into chapters 1, 2, and 3. And this comes to the end of chapter 1. The end of chapter 1 ends on a very um, heavy note, right? In a sense, like you say, you know, choose leaders, but the purpose of it is because there's so much problem in the church there, and the, 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 the false teachers are the big problem. So Titus, it is time for us to solve this problem, okay? And you need to get rid of the false teachers. And that's that for the end of, um, for the, the, the whole uh, uh, chapter of, the whole first chapter of Titus. Maybe let's just uh, do a, a quick run through of what were some of the things that we, we observed today. Okay, in, in this uh, first chapter of Titus. Okay, first up, um, it is important for um, it is important for there to be order and leadership in the church, right? And therefore, Paul was so insistent as saying that Titus, you need to 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 find leaders to your churches, right? You, why do you need to find leaders to your churches? Because there needs to be order in the church. Right, and chaos and in, in, Paul, in Paul's eyes, chaos and non recognition of authority are worse than insistence um, or being over, overly dogmatic about church government. Okay, um, chaos and non recognition of authority are worse. Okay, leaders are to be successful people in discipline and character, and sometimes, sometimes strong discipline is required, right? in the case of the false teachers that we see in Titus. But yet at the same time, I think Paul exemplifies um, what it means to discipline in love. Um, and, Paul, and, and we saw that Paul's hope right, um, for disciplining people, for disciplining these people who are deviant, uh, the deviant Christians and, and stuff like this, his hope right, was that you know, for them to turn around, to change their ways so that they will, they will stand right with God again okay and um we see in titus and we'll see we see in this first chapter we'll see a lot in the next two chapters also that a moral morals and ethics of a christian are important right we'll see that we saw that doing good the word doing good right is repeated time and time again in these pastoral letters i mean even you look at the end of verse even you look at the end of verse 16, he say, Paul actually says this, these false teachers, they are detestable, they are unfit for any good work. They cannot do good at all, right? These clowns are, are just not cut out to do good, right? They, they really need to be stopped. And, and doing good for a Christian is of primary importance. And there is a major distinction between true and false teachers therefore right a true teacher you'll see someone that whatever he teaches his life his actions right are in line with the things that he teaches false teachers on their hand are uh, um they claim to know god but they don't do the things that god commands and therefore i think i'll end off with this that um a truly spiritual person will not seek to display his own inner holiness but right but the inner self will nonetheless be seen, and rightly so, in the doing of good works. And Jesus re reminds us this in Matthew chapter 7, verse 20, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Right? And a Christian is always known, a tree is known by fruit. And so I pray that all of us as Christians, we will be known by our fruit. And when people see us, they will look at us and say, hey, we know that these people are Christians. And with that, we conclude with Titus chapter 1.